Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, now I can hear you. <laughs> oh, okay, good. How are you? Are you are you Marianne? Yes, I'm Marianne. And let oh. me just change the name on this. I, I had to sign in with my boss's e e um, credentials. <laughs> let me start my video. He has the master account for these things. So let me just change that. <laughs> And my headphones are working, but. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. Good. Now I can hear you. Oh, this is great. Thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> so it looks like you're at work. I am at work. I, <laughs> it's a long story, but I'm living where my aunt was living. And um, there's no internet out on the lake. So um, I have to do this at work. <laughs> that sounds nice though, to be able to disconnect it is at least a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it is kind of nice. <laughs> Are you at home? I am. I The campus is, is pretty secure right now. They, they prefer us not to go on campus. Yeah. Um, but I'm in faculty housing, so I'm not too, too far away. Um, I put my two-year-old to bed early, so <laughs> I'm hoping there won't be any interruptions. <laughs> That's okay if there are. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, you never know. <laughs> yeah, it'll. It's it's interesting working from home and. So yeah, I think so. <laughs> Oops. Oh, pardon me. Sorry, I'm just wiping things down. Sounds like there's this new variant of the virus that's more contagious than moves. Yeah, unfortunately, I think that that is true. And we just found out that where I am is right where Nebraska and Iowa and South Dakota come together. Uh-huh. And then we just found out that the really... Um, strong strain is, strain is now in Nebraska. So it's like right there. So um, we'll see. <laughs> you know, I'm sure it's just, I'm sure it's everywhere. Yeah, it's just, yeah. I think you're right. <laughs> it's just some people are finding out before others, but I think about around this time last year, you know, it was in a similar situation that, that we knew there was a virus, but we didn't know a lot about it. and. Yeah, that's what's happening now with this new virus. Yeah, it's really crazy. I mean, yeah, I just got um, an email from some friends in Australia and they, Australia and New Zealand are doing so well. Australia hasn't had a new case for two months and New Zealand even longer. And they're just under such better leadership that they've been able to deal with this and there's really no reason that we shouldn't have been able to deal with it i know that is i have i don't go out a lot but i i i do go to the grocery store and now i'm starting to worry about that again because the community spread is just so rampant right now and yeah yeah it's crazy it really is and then, of course, what happened yesterday? Yeah, Gosh. yeah. What happened yesterday? It, it's just on. It's not unexpected, just because of everything that's happened in the last four years, but it's still shocking. I think. Oh, it's absolutely still unbelievable, and still so disheartening. I mean, I just hope that the next few weeks are calm. How are people in your community handling it? How are they reacting to it? You know, this area of the country is so conservative. Um, there, I mean, people in the arts are not necessarily conservative, but the people who are in the larger community are more conservative. And so it, it's really split. What about where you are? Um, here, it's actually pretty liberal, pretty progressive. Um, 
at least this part of Massachusetts, I think when you get further west, it, it starts to become a little more conservative. Um, you know, I just, I guess I've just haven't really talked to a lot of people except by phone. And I'm originally from California, so I have friends in California. And yeah. I think they've echoed your sentiment, which is it's not shocking or not surprising, but nonetheless, it's just really hard to process. And mm -hmm. I've been glued to, it's been really hard to focus the last 24 hours. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, actually, starting with with um, the elections, right? That right. was <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's been a couple of nights of just not really sleeping well and and thinking about what's going on in in the greater country, you know. And just, yeah. it's just I don't know. Well, it'll be interesting to see if anyone even shows up. Um, yeah, well, I'm sure people, will. Um, yeah. people have have um, registered and so that's all really good and actually oh, I have my laptop from home here because we don't have a camera on our city computers so I'm going to turn around real quickly and put the um, contact information on the Facebook page just oh, sure. in case anybody because I think we had a disconnect and I I don't want to lose anybody so I'm going to turn around and do that really quickly and sure. then, the people who, if there is any confusion, they know yeah. what's on us. <laughs> so can I ask you though, just really quickly before you turn around, um, yeah. I just have some slides of like, I, I did like a progression of, of my work um, and hopefully that's okay. Is that? Oh, yeah. That's totally okay. fine. Yeah. That's okay. Fine. I didn't know if you wanted a, just a and a or, so I prepared a little bit of everything. So <laughs> yeah, I think it's really important to give people some place to start. And that's yeah. what Will and Mark both did is, is talked about the work and the progression. And then people put um, their questions in the queue in the chat room. And then I would just ask them just to, so that you're not responding to however many different people. Um, then so we'll do the same thing tonight. Perfect. Perfect. Yes. And okay. you know, I think some people will still join. I think some people look for a way to disconnect from the craziness for a little while. And I hope that's true yeah. to me. Well, we'll see, we'll see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I guess the good thing about Zoom is I don't know. <laughs> I'll know. <laughs> I look at the participants and I'm like, oh no, it'll be fine. I mean, and I know that, um, like one of my sisters really has been coming to all of the programs. And so that's been really great. Oh, good. I know will be there and my husband will be there. So I think some people will be there. <laughs> we count on two. That's good. <laughs> that's better than zero. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll let you. I'm sorry to mean to interrupt no, you. <laughs> totally fine. I think that sounds wonderful. And um, I'm really looking forward to your presentation <laughs> because I just think your work is so beautifully done and oh thank you reading about you know why you're doing what you're doing it's it's just so elegant and i really appreciate that thank you thank you that made my night so okay. <laughs> if that's the takeaway from tonight i'm happy with that <laughs> Well, I really like talking about your work when I do little small tours. Good. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. <It's> tours. <laughs> it's just crazy times we're living in. It's <laughs> it crazy times. We're open um, with masks and with um, social distancing. And occasionally I have done small tours with a microphone and people sort of yeah. spread out. And yeah. Yeah, we were... I can't remember if we just closed down the cultural institutions or it might be heading that way, but we've had, we've had museums and those spaces open. Um, I don't know now with the surge, if, if that's going to change, I anticipate it will. I think it will, especially since the Smithsonian has closed and um, a lot of museums follow their lead. So uh, I think we may be headed for that. Yeah. Oh, well, I, it's. I think we only have ten more days, right, before the exhibition was to come right. down. Right. Which is good. I mean, it, it's just bad timing yeah. all the way around. It was bad timing for the Figgy Museum as well, um, yeah. this summer. Because, but it, you know, it is what it is, and there'll be a catalog, and so that's the show will live <laughs> on. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> 
we're eventually we'll come to a new normal. No good. People are people are joining, so that's good. I'm gonna just go really quickly and put this information on the um, web page, and I'll be right back. Okay. Actually, a lot of people are signing up, so that's really good. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Notices that people are signing up, so there's a whole string of them, so that's great. That should do it. Right. <laughs> I'm wondering, um, should I check to make sure that I can share my screen? Yeah. Okay, let me. Okay, so I'm getting a message host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh, that's weird. Okay, let me see if I can make you. And of course, I can't offer any help with Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really strange. Um, breakout room restrictions. Let's see. See if there's a way to make host. Okay. Oh, great. Okay, let's see if I can do it now. Okay, you should be able to do it. And I just made you the yes. host. Okay, great. Great, thank you. You're welcome. That should work. Great. Okay. We'll just wait a couple minutes. It's not quite 630 anyway. But people are starting to come on. <laughs> oh, that's yeah, that's fine. My, as I mentioned to you earlier, my relationship to time is just so <laughs> strange these days. <laughs> yeah, I think I think a lot of people's have that same sort of reaction. What day is it? What time is it? Where am I? Uh, what's going on? <laughs> oh. And there, there's just one more artist talk, or it's it's the curator. It, it, it's Andrew Wallace, who's the curator from the Figgy Museum. He um, will be we'll be showing his presentation Tuesday night, um, okay. is coming Tuesday night, which I'll, I'll mention to everybody. Great. Yeah. I should try to 
to zoom in on that and just to see. <laughs> yeah, I think it would be. Um, I think it'll be really interesting. I've watched the. Um, I've watched his the video that we have from him, and it's really interesting because it sort of contextualizes the whole exhibition. And right. we, initially, we were going to do that at the beginning, but things just happened so that we had to do it at the end, which is actually fine because it's a nice way to tie it up and wrap right. up the whole exhibition a week before it closes. So it, it works out really well. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, especially since I didn't get a chance to, to visit and see the exhibition. <laughs> I don't think many people did. <laughs> the two times that I was there, there were only I think I had the gallery to myself most of the time that I was there and the second time I was there I was there for several hours wow. um, just to figure out what we were bringing here to Sioux City and I don't think anybody else came in in that entire two hours which was great for me but not great for the museum right it's a beautiful space from what I've seen yeah. online <laughs> yeah it is a beautiful building and they did a great job. Can you go in and make me the co-host? Because I think I made you the host. If you make me the co-host, then I can. Yes, let me see if I know how to do. Yes, I think I can. So if you go to participants and look up my name, you should be able. Yeah, you did it. OK. Cool. All right, that's perfect. I've been teaching over Zoom now for several months. You would think that it's all muscle memory. <laughs> Or that I'd figure it out, but when you only do it once every couple months, it's like, oh, what am I doing? <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> how are your classes going online? So we, I, I met Wellesley College, and we have some students in person, mm -hmm. which means that the college has been testing students twice a week. Um, I think faculty that interact with students are tested once a week. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I was teaching the first term I taught in person and then the second term I taught hybrid. Um, and it's actually worked out really well. Oh, good. You know, there, it is a sort of combination of synchronous and asynchronous material, but overall I have to say that the, the president um, has really handled it really well. The Definitely. numbers and everything have been very low. Good. So it's, it's been really like a remarkable uh, community experience. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've all tried to really maintain that, that bubble, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> keeping each other safe and, and um, it's, it's worked. So That's great. I'm grateful. <laughs> well, especially with a young, a young child. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, I've, I wouldn't want to get sick. That's for sure. I've, you know, I have friends my age that have gotten sick um, early on, and mm -hmm. the way that they describe it, it has not been a picnic. No, no, the people that I know who've been sick have not. Yeah, it is worse than anything they've ever experienced. So, yeah, yeah, yeah so I, I definitely don't want to take my chances, but um, next, next semester, I, I teach one term in person and then the second, the last term I teach remotely. So we'll see. I've been, I've been fortunate so far and mm -hmm. that this, the students have been very responsible. That's great. That's really good. No, oh, people are joining. So we will wait just a couple more minutes and then, yeah. then we'll get started. It was my first year, though, here teaching at the school, and so that's been really challenging. <laughs> <laughs> that's so hard to start a new position in the middle of a pandemic or at the beginning of a pandemic. Yeah, that's been it's been interesting. <laughs> <laughs> like you don't get the same opportunity to interact with people at all. Oh, I just can't wait for things to become a little more normal. I really miss interacting with people. I think we all do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Wait, maybe 
just a minute more and then we'll get started. Yeah, um, absolutely. Like my daughter's asleep, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Don't hear any crying. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. <laughs> I'm very strict about her bedtime. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing, though. It was hard to implement at first, um, but now we're so grateful that we've done it. <laughs> <laughs> I think like every new parent, the sleep training is so daunting. And <laughs> How old? She's 23 months, so not, not too yet. <laughs> That must have been an exciting Christmas then. <laughs> oh, it was so fun. <laughs> she understands presents and the tree. She gets very excited about Christmas trees. <laughs> yeah, that too is such a, such a great age. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, I still have a few years where she'll love me unconditionally. <laughs> <laughs> that changes again. <laughs> Changes again. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of the cycle. Well, shall we go ahead and get started? Sure, whatever, whatever you want. Yeah, yeah. and I think people. I mean, there's there people can join us. There's no restriction, so people okay. can join us as they, as they can. So, I'm Marianne Redding, curator at the Sioux City Art Center, and it is my pleasure tonight to bring you the digital Zoom program with photographer Kathy Landeros. It's in conjunction with the exhibition Magnetic West, the enduring allure of the American West. It was curated by Andrew Wallace at the Figgy Museum in Davenport, Iowa. We're going to wrap up our magnetic programming with a video presentation from Andrew next Tuesday evening, January 12th at 6.30. The Art Center is extremely pleased to have partnered with the Figgy Museum to bring you this important exhibition, which is closing on January 17th in a week and a half. So if you haven't been to the Art Center yet to see the installation and you're close enough to do that, please come in. We require masks, there's social distancing in each of the galleries, and chances are pretty good that you will have the galleries to yourself during your visit. So thank you for joining us for this very special evening. Tonight's programming is brought to you is brought to you by the Gilchrist, the Gilchrist Foundation, the Art Center's Blockbuster Partners. So one thing, just a little bit of housekeeping that I would ask everybody to do is make sure that you are muted just in case. I think we've got everybody muted, but please take a moment to do that. And also, if you have questions, um, please put them in the Q&A and we'll answer them at the end of the evening. Um, I'd like to also thank the Sioux City Public Museum for allowing us to reproduce copies of images from their photo archives that contextualize the exhibition here in the Siouxland area. Um, you can see the public museum photographs displayed on the walls outside the galleries on the third floor. And when you do come to the museum, remember that the installation is in two galleries, the main gallery and then the jet galleries behind Grant Wood's corn mural room. And tonight, I'm delighted to introduce to you Cassia Landeros as our guest artist. She's a Mexican-American photographer and educator. Cassia was born in Northern California to Mexican parents. Her creative work is inspired by her upbringing as an immigrant and her family's history of immigra immigration. Influenced by her bicultural upbringing, her work focuses on Latinx communities and the exploration of history, migration, representation, and belonging. Her quietly exquisite photographs document long-standing immigrant communities in the American West, where her family, along with so many other immigrants, settled due to an ongoing presence of agricultural work. Kathy holds a graduate degree in photography from Massachusetts College of Art and Design, Mass Art, and a dual undergraduate degree in English Literature and Hispanic Studies from Vassar College. Her research has been supported with fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, an AIGA World Studio Foundation grant, and a Fulbright Fellowship, as well as residencies at the Reiko Photo Center and the Center for Photography at Woodstock. Kathy has lived in both China and Mexico, where she worked on long-term projects with migrant and immigrant communities, documenting the socioeconomic effects of migration, investigating the ties between economy, labor, and community. She's always been interested in exploring the common interests and shared experiences between Mexico and the US, 
intertwined as the two countries and their peoples are in the West. Her experience in both countries has allowed her to think beyond the diversive descriptions of borderlands with their narrative of violence and poverty. Kathy feels it is important to include not only the contributions of Latino immigrants within the narrative of the American West, but also others as a more accurate portrayal of life in the suburbs and farming communities of the West. Kathy has several images in the magnetic West and they do just what she intends them to do. They eloquently add to the diverse narrative of voices that is central to the entire magnetic West exhibition. Please join me in welcoming Kathy Landeros. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And um, thank you for inviting me today. Um, you know, for extending this invitation. I'm, I'm really sorry that I'm not able to be there in person, um, but also just so grateful that I'm able to share some of my work over Zoom. So in organizing uh, this virtual studio visit, I took it as an opportunity to share the trajectory of my work, um, which has spanned almost 15 years now, including some of my earliest influences and the work that led up to the West, which is currently at Sioux City um, Art Center. And so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And I think once I do that, I won't be able to see anyone. So please let me know if you can still hear me. Pardon. Okay. Can you see that, Marianne? Yes. Great. Yep. Okay. So I'm gonna, since I'm my internet connection can be a little bit um, questionable. <laughs> I'm gonna see if I could take off my own screen sharing. So give me just a second while I turn off my video. I think that'll speed it up a little bit. Okay, so can you still see the slides? Yep, we sure can. Thank you, great. Um, so like so many photographers, I very early on was struck by the work of Robert Frank um, that, you know, that he published in The Americans in the 19, or as a book called The Americans in 1955. As Marianne mentioned, I was an undergraduate majoring in English literature and Hispanic studies. And one of the first books that I read in college that I was completely mesmerized by was South to a Very Old Place by Albert Murray. Um, if anyone is familiar with that book, you know, the cadence of its language, um, it's, it's almost like music or, or poetry. So when I saw Robert Frank's The Americans, I understood that photography could function in a similar way, that it could function like a language. Um, the poet Kerouac, I think so beautifully stated it that um, in the introduction to The Americans that Frank managed to suck a sad poem right out of America. Um, but I think equally important, what I was really struck by with the work was Frank's vision of the United States as a Swiss immigrant photographing in the 50s. Um, his idea of the United States was maybe perhaps more inclusive and it certainly deviated from traditional mainstream representations. Um, this is one of my favorite, favorite images from that photo book, from that body of work. It's seemingly referencing that man's Americanness his identity as a US American, I think by capturing this moment in front of the jukebox, um, which is you know, this, this symbol of American culture. And one of the other photographers whose work I also greatly admire is Dorothea Lange's work, um, primarily her work with the Farm Security Administration during the depression. I think it's probably the work that she's best known for and it began with um, Paul Taylor, who eventually became her partner, to borrow 
Linda Gordon's words, he was a humanist economist and based out of UC Berkeley, he was one of the first social scientists to really focus his work on Mexican and Mexican American workers in the West. So together he and Lang produced several photo textual reports um, that they hoped would improve the living and working conditions of farm workers in California who at this point were predominantly Mexican to offer some statistics, for example, by 1920, 84% of the agricultural labor force in Los Angeles was Mexican. And in the San Joaquin Valley, it was 56%. So what they advocated for was um, the building of government camps. But during Lang's work in the resettlement administration, I think you know the challenge that she came up against was that um, that aid was meant for people that had been recently, um, I guess, recently displaced by the depression and by the Dust Bowl. And so uh, I think the bureaucratic people in charge understood that the Mexican and Mexican American workers had always sort of lived like this. And so it wasn't their priority. Um, and, you know, I, I also, I want to just point out the captions in Lang's photographs. All of these photographs can be found on the Library of Congress online. But, you know, the way that she captions things, the amount of information that she places in her photographs, I think, um, is really a testament to the documentation of the lives of these workers. And in this particular image, um, it's a mother talking about um, the labor situation and repatriation. And based on my own family's history, I've come to understand that during economic downturns, um, the history of this country has always had a rise of nativism that coincides with economic downturns um, and also increases in deportations. So that's going to lead me to the first chapter of, of what's really been a very long term project on Latinx communities and that's called Tierra Nuestra, um, which is all black and white, unlike the work that is in Sioux City right now. Um, as Marianne, as you mentioned, I was raised in Northern California in the Central Valley. So there's a really strong connection to farm work and agriculture there and a deep respect for migrant workers um, with this understanding that it is very laborious but also essential work. And when you drive along the interstate um, the I-5 or the 99 in California, you see huge tracts of farmland. So some of the earliest work that I was doing was going into these labor camps where migrant farm workers lived um, and often lived really isolated from the community at large. You know, because some of these farms were also very huge, huge um, farms and the idea that, for me, the idea of invisibility, it, it kind of came to represent a vulnerability, maybe a lack of acknowledgement um, of the people who were, who are contributing to some very fundamental work in our society. You know, they're gathering the crops that feed us. But most importantly, I think it really set in place um, this process of discussing the legacy of Mexican and Mexican American workers in the West. And I will say that during this time, the way that I, I, I got access to these places was that my father, when he first came to the United States, he did some farm work, he went back to school. Um, and eventually got a college degree and worked for an, orga an organization that was helping migrant farm workers. And so it was through um, accompanying him and his colleagues that I was able to access some of these more remote places. But for me, I thought it was important because, you know, photographs, they can be really definitive. Um, they serve as hallmarks of, of our experience. They define who we are and 
you know, they serve as, as our memory, as our cultural memory as well. So one of the biggest challenges that came from doing this work over a period of a couple of years was the negotiation of representing this reality. You know, on the one hand of not wanting to romanticize it, but at the same time also not wanting to represent um, Mexican and Mexican Americans as the other. You know, I think, you know, being in a state of poverty, of distress, because I think that too is a negation. And with that in mind, you know, it set up the second chapter of my work, which took me outside the anonymity of these farm camps. Um, I stopped at this photograph because this photograph reminds me so much of the photograph that I found of my grandmother at this age. <laughs> um, and so going outside past the anonymity of the farm camps, um, I, I wanted to go into communities that would be more apparent and more accessible. And by accessible, I mean, you know, something that people could find more relatable. It's like that, that moment of looking at that picture of Robert Frank with the man in front of the jukebox, something that symbolized um, and, and felt more resonant or maybe universal for us as a society. Um, and during this time, a friend of mine suggested that I watch The Killer of Sheep. And for those of you who have not seen that film, it's an excellent film. It was made by Charles Burnett, um, a Black filmmaker in the 70s at UCLA when he was a graduate student there. It was his thesis. Um, he made it in his neighborhood in Watts in Los Angeles. And the cast and crew were mostly comprised of people in his community. So what Burnett said was that he wanted to make a film um, about things that resonate, you know, things that seem simple, but have universal meaning. And even though his film came from a segregated experience, it was, you know, it was predominantly about black subject matter. It was still about the American experience. So these seemingly mundane quotidian moments, you know, for me, they, they're the equalizers. Um, and I'll stop, well, I'll stop here with Juan Carlos and, and Anna. Um, yeah, you know, for me, nothing symbolized more than, than that, than like the suburban and urban or semi-urban Latino communities. And um, as, as Marianne, as you've also referenced um, in the introduction that I think part of the problem in the representation, the historical representation of Latino communities and immigrant communities has been being presented as foreigners, you know, and, and for Mexicans and Mexican Americans, that's really the divisiveness of, of borderlands and border wars. Um, so, you know, how do, how do I push up against those stereotypes and those assumptions? And, and that became really important to me. So to further underscore this, um, I wanted to work in central Mexico. And the reason for that is that um, in central Mexico has the highest rates of historic migration to the United States. Um, so with the help of a Fulbright, I was able to live and work in Mexico for a period of two years. Um, and these are communities that have been completely transformed through a century of migration to the United States. You know, and that, that has really, I think, inextricably linked both people and, and the countries together. Um, this, is, this is an example of a woman I met in the farm camps in Northern California. Her name is Catalina and her mother lived in Guanajuato State. Guanajuato State is where my father is from. My mother is from Jalisco State. So I spent time photographing three of the four states in central Mexico with the highest rates of historic migration. Um, that's Jalisco, Guanajuato, Michoacan, and there's also Zacatecas. And you know, these are communities where there's this sort of ebb and flow of migration. Um, these are people coming back for 
festivities. You could see that car has Colorado plates. This is a house built very much to, um, in the style of a suburban house in the United States. Um, these are kids celebrating Halloween, which is not a Mexican. I mean, traditionally, it's not a Mexican holiday. <laughs> Um, this is Anna Karen meeting her aunt for the first time. Yeah, you know, I, I found that interdependence between the two countries and, and its people really, really, really interesting. And then thinking about a hybrid, car hybrid culture of, of people understanding both US and US American and Mexican culture kind of straddling both worlds in, in a similar way that, that I did, or I have. Um, these are uh, three sisters coming back for their first communion to celebrate that with their family. They, they live in Los Angeles and they came back to celebrate with their godparents. Um, this is Maria Angeles, whom I later actually photographed um, in Texas. She eventually left this very small town that had been emptied out um, all the men were gone, you know, mostly all the young people had left. So this is a really small town in Guanajuato, mostly elderly and women and young children. This was someone who had spent most of his life in the United States and then was deported. Um, so he was telling me a little bit about that experience. And I should say that the reason why historically there has been such a high rate of migration from these states is that um, the way that the railroad was constructed beginning in the 20th century, um, there were labor contractors that would take the railroad lines all the way down to central Mexico. Northern Mexico wasn't as populated, especially at the beginning of the 20th century, and they would gather workers and bring them back up to the United States. And so the railroad sort of, it, it allowed this, this natural transportation, you know, it facilitated the transportation of people. Um, and also because there was a need for laborers. And that's going to bring me to, uh, I guess the two most recent body, bodies of work and, I say they're recent, but I've been working on them for about eight years now and trying to just bring them to a conclusion. Um, there are kind of two chapters that are separate, but also not <laughs> separate, you know, that I, I, I see as being uh, as one, being one. Um, and that's Verdant Land and West. And I think there are images from both projects at Sioux City. Um, I think of this as a distillation, perhaps, of the earliest work, you know, this black and white work. And while I was at an artist residency, um, it allowed me to really distill this work to its essence. And I made an artist book where I had found these photographs of uh, my family. So this is my mother, um, who was born in the who was born in Mexico, but spent a lot of time as a child in the United States. And here she is in a farm labor camp. And then this is my father in the seventies. Um, and you know, I just thought that it was like my own story, my own family narrative of all of my ancestors who who worked as laborers. You know, starting with my second great grandfather who worked in Arizona, the mines of Arizona to my grandfather who was a bracero, which was a US government um, sanctioned worker program that brought people to, to work as farm workers um, to the United States. My parents being farm workers that, you know, that spoke a little bit to what I was trying to convey in these photographs. So, this body of work, it's comprised of portraits and landscapes. And, you know, the landscape, I think it's, for me, verdant land and the West, it's, it's a very luscious, very verdant, very fertile uh, landscape because it comes to represent the American West as this land of opportunity and of promise. And, you know, I was thinking about this landscape um, not only in terms of representing 
it's abundance, it's fecundity, um, but showing that it's not an entirely natural landscape. You know, this is this is land that has been cultivated by people. You know, the people are are directly uh, influenced by the landscape and have also influenced it. You know, and ultimately, I think for me, it's a way of saying that that I and and other Mexican Americans that we have not been strangers to the history of this this nation. And this is my this is my great or this is actually my grandmother. Um, but again, you know, exploring the history of economy and labor, it has been really central to the all of the photograph work that I've done. And in the American West, that that work has been primarily tied to agricultural agricultural work and an agricultural economy. So some of these towns that I photographed, you know, they might be 50, 60, 70, 80, sometimes even 90% um, Latino. And some of the smaller communities, um, like this, this is a perfect example. This is an area of further further north in, in Washington state, eastern Washington. It's it's an area that that grows the majority of apples for our country. And you know, you can see that it's a very sort of typical Western landscape with those storefronts. It could be like in a Western movie, but um, a lot of the businesses, these storefronts would be empty, but they've been revitalized by the immigrant community there. So some of this work was actually made um, last summer before the pandemic, which might be, yeah, last summer, not a little bit over, I guess a year and a half ago, gosh, <laughs> it cut my work a little bit short. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, this is a government subsidized farm camp in Northern California, about an hour north of where I grew up. You know, one of these farm camps that Dorothea Lang and Paul Taylor advocated to have built in, in the 30s. This photograph, um, it, it sort of reminds, it's my, it's my version of the American Gothic. <laughs> This is before the harvest, you know, sort of the lineup of the work that's to come. Anytime I can, I can insert something that seems kind of iconic or symbolic, like the foam booth um, or this very sort of Edward Hopper-esque, <laughs> um, you know, landscape with the green neon lights coming out of this this laundromat. It really, you know, it, it it's exactly the sort of thing that I'm looking for. And some of the some of these folks you might actually recognize from some of the earlier photographs in, in Mexico, like one of the the boys I photographed him as a child in Mexico, and then he came to the United States, and I was able to photograph him there. You know, and and I mean, I'm hoping that at a time when in, 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 when excuse me when immigration has become such a contentious issue. Um, that these photographs may serve as a reminder of the contribution that immigrants, not just Latino immigrants, but all immigrants have made, you know, and, and will continue to make to the development of, of this country. But I also do hope that it, it 
offers a counterpoint to uh, the traditional views of the American West, you know, and, and to include Latinos in that photographic narrative. This is um, along the Russian River in Northern California. I was really struck by the family lying on the uh, American flag towel or blanket. This is a birthday party at a farm worker's house who lives on the property where they work. You know, another one of these towns that it would be a ghost town um, if it hadn't been revitalized by the Latino community and, and people starting businesses. Mostly to, you know, cater to um, the workers there. I think this is the last photograph on the 4th of July taken last summer. I think that's it. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, it's only 35 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> no, that's perfect. That's great. So if, if anybody has questions, um, please put them in the chat and I can ask Cassia if you have questions. Um, thank you so much. I mean, the work is so quiet and so eloquent and I, I really appreciate you sharing with it with us. Oh, thank you. It's always fun to, as nerve wracking as these things can sometimes be, because I, I, even though I teach, I always get nervous about public speaking. You would think that after years of teaching that I would, I would just be an expert at this. But the great thing about this is it gives me an opportunity to really sort of sit with the work and make sense of it. And um, that was, that was really fun. <laughs> Good. That was that was really great to and and to share the work is also a real treat. So thank you for everyone for. <laughs> I don't think nervousness ever really goes away. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably true. <laughs> Keeps us honest that nervousness. <laughs> it does. So do you have um, projects that you want to work on next following the, when you wrap these up? If you do wrap these up which I kind of hope you don't. I'd like to see more and more. <laughs> and I, th I think I will continue to work in Latino communities, but I'm hoping to sort of expand the geographic area. Um, now, especially now that I'm spending more time out East, um, it, you know, I, I'm on a tenure track position here, so, I don't think, I think I might've found my forever home um, as much as I, I would have loved to have ended up in California closer to my, my family. But um, yeah, you know, I would love to spend time in other parts of, of the country, you know, including the Midwest. Um, I was able to spend some time in, in North Carolina a couple of years ago and absolutely loved photographing there you know that's that's rooted in a lot of tobacco farming so there's certainly other areas geographic areas that i'd like to explore you know it's just hard <laughs> especially with a little girl a little daughter did you did you photograph when you were in china i did i did i photographed in a community um that was not i wouldn't say it's it was the outskirts of, of Shanghai, but it was sort of, it was, it was sort of on the cusp of, uh, well, it was being demolished while I was living there. And it was this historic neighborhood where people were being relocated to further out into the suburbs. And um, at this point, a lot of, a lot of migrant workers had, had settled into these, this area before you know, to work either in construction. Um, so it was kind of an area of flux. And it was really interesting, you know, as a foreigner, because I had I had someone who could help translate for me. And on the one hand, you know, there were people that um, 
the living conditions there in these old buildings, they were not great. You know, they, they were, they were houses that had been um, divided up. So there were a lot of families living in there without, you know, plumbing and heating. And so of course they wanted to live in a more modern um, facility, but you know, the sadness of it is that, is that a lot of these communities were being broken up, you know, so people that had lived close together for a long time um, were all of a sudden being dispersed into different areas of, of Shanghai. So it was, it was a very interesting, um, you know, exploration for me, but I also was very cautious in, in the assumptions that, that I made because, you know, I'm a stranger working in a foreign land and who am I to make those, those judgments, you know? <laughs> Um, so I tried to really just be open and listen to people's stories and photograph. Um, and it was really, I mean, it was really very interesting and eye-opening. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a couple questions from the audience to ask you. How, um, this first one is, how does changing immigration policy currently um, impact your work? Um, that's a really great question because you know, I have to say that it hasn't, it hasn't, at its core, it hasn't really changed my work because I believe that, um, that for me, the thing that I really want to underscore is the humanity, you know, like this really shared experience that we all have. Um, I just don't think, you know, it's just so divisive. And so that this divisiveness is, is the thing that reaffirms my belief that that we need to unify in some way um but you know that's with that being said when i read about these um ice camps and you know children being separated it just really breaks my heart and sometimes i wish that you know maybe i should be photograph you know i should be trying to get access to that and photographing that and um, you know, documenting this moment in time that that I think will truly be, um, you know, something to be looked at in the future. Um, I just don't, I just don't know if I'm the person to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, but so to answer the question is that I've remained steadfast in what I've been doing, but not without doubt <laughs> as to, you know, maybe my sense of urgency should be, maybe it's displaced. <laughs> Thank you for answering that question. That's, it's a, that's a tough one. Um, yeah, but a good, it's a really good question. Mm -hmm. Here's the next question that, that Gail asked, have you been able to exhibit your work in Mexico? Um, no, actually, I'm, I'm trying to remember, I might have had a very sort of informal um, show of the work a few times, you know, like slideshows and things in, in Mexico when I was there and sharing the work with the communities that I photographed in. But no, I haven't, I haven't really um, shared, shared that work at all in Mexico. You know, and part of that is that I think, um, well, I don't know. I guess, you know, I just, maybe because I have been living in the United States. So the, when I was on that Fulbright, it was 2007, 2008. And I do remember that it was a period where um, some of the areas that I was photographing, you know, like the drug violence and, and, you know, the violence was starting to escalate, especially in like the state of Michoacan. Um, and then I started graduate school and now I have a family, I have a baby. Um, so it's just because of, of being in school and all of my life's attendant responsibilities that it never allowed me to go back as much as I wanted to go back. Um, my parents have gone back and unfortunately I think the situation in the areas that I was photographing in, you know, like the area where my mom and my great grandmother lived, um, it's actually pretty bad, you know? So I, I think I think I would be a little bit more fearful um, of going back into some of the communities that I was photographing in because 
Well, I say this with the caveat that, you know, once you're there, it's different, <laughs> right? If you're listening to the news, it's horrible. When you're there, it's, it's, it's all different. Um, and you just try to live the way the local community lives and, and handle things the way the local community does. But I guess, I guess I just haven't really had an opportunity and, and, you know, in the back of my mind, it feels like maybe it's just not the right time to go back to Mexico. Mm -hmm. There's Gosh, no I hope, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I hope that's, I hope that doesn't sound horrible, but you know, when my parents, my parents were going back and forth for many years. And when they finally told me like a year and a half ago that they weren't going back because um, it was pretty, they were scared. That's, mm -hmm. I think that was my wake up call. <laughs> you know, it's usually the other way around my mom telling me not to do something. <laughs> now I'm like, no, you don't do that mom. <laughs> <laughs> the cycle of life. Um, yeah. <laughs> here's another question that came in from Roger. Does a particular setting or subject di dictate whether you use color or black and white? Um, a particular subject. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? It's something to do with, with either color and black and white, um, but versus subject and subject matter or um, setting? or subject setting. matter? Does a particular setting or subject matter um, dictate whether you choose to use color or black and white? Yes, I would say that it does. Um, now, a lot of this is maybe, I'm going to try to contextualize it and intellectualize it a little bit, but I think a lot of it is just intuitive. Um, you know, with color, someone told me once and i think that i took this advice to heart is that with color um it it really speaks to the moment and i think stephen shore who is a photographer and teaches photography and wrote a very uh seminal photo book um that we as educators use he writes that that with color you can place it based on color you know, like, you know, the color of like Technicolor, the films, if it's from the 50s or the 60s or the 80s. And so color tends to make things feel very contemporary, whereas black and white sometimes has a feeling of maybe being more nostalgic or timeless. Um, and so I think that I take that into consideration. Um, and, you know, I think, I think for the West and Verdant Land, I felt like the work needed to be uh, maybe like to feel more of this time, mm -hmm. you know? And so that's why I made that shift over to color. At a practical level, col color, I still photograph with film and so it's very expensive. <laughs> and I photograph using large format cameras and medium format cameras. Um, you know, a lot of that work is actually large format. It's four by five. And so um, it's it can be prohibitive. And so that's sometimes, that's sometimes when I tell myself, you should really be doing this in black and white. You know, if you're gonna expose a sheet of eight by 10 film, it's probably half the cost of it, you know, being black and white versus color and being able to develop it um, at home in my bathroom versus sending it off to be processed in a lab. So that's the other part of that equation, which we don't like to talk about. <laughs> it's the money part, <laughs> but also very, you know, very, very real. <laughs> okay, and one more question that just came in. Um, what sort of responses do you get from the people as you talk to them about photographing them? And can I add a part to that? Do you give them a photograph? I, I yes, yes, I, I try to be really good about that. Um, although I've had had moments where I've lapsed, but I, I, that, I tend to do that, you know, that's just my uh, way of working and trying to go back into communities. And there's people that I've photographed over periods of years. Um, and, you know, sometimes, so it, it's, it kind of varies because some of the people are people that I know very well, they're family members, they're people that I've been introduced to. And then, um, 
through an initial encounter vis-a-vis -vis photography, I might remain, you know, we might remain friends or they'll never get rid of me once, once I photograph them. <laughs> you know? Like I become, I become their friend. Um, and, you know, other times there are pictures like the, the guy by the, um, the telephone booth that was a one-time encounter. You know, it was almost like a street photograph where I approached him and um, asked if I could make a picture at that moment, had him, you know, stay still and made the photograph. Um, so that all, I always try to explain what I'm doing. That's not always an easy thing to do because sometimes I don't even know what I'm doing. You know, it's, it's, it's in other words, if I had an end goal, you know, if I said, oh, I'm photographing for this newspaper, I'm photographing this story, or, um, you know, it would be a lot easier to explain. So I have to, I usually have to tell people like, this is what I'm working on. It's very abstract. Um, I show them pictures. And, you know, I think most of the time people understand, but maybe only through really getting to know me over a period of time. So I do, I do prefer engaging with people um, longer term than just sort of like that, that one off photograph that some of those photographs are, you know, it helps. I speak Spanish. Um, so, you know, I'm able to explain to people uh, what I'm doing and, you know, that I think that is a big shift of going from my early work to the large format work. The early work was all done 35 millimeter and this, this later work is large format and medium format. For those of you who might not know what large format is, it's, it's, it's a really old fashioned box camera and every exposure is, you know, either four by five or bigger. Um, you get two exposures, um, you, you wear that dark cloth. So it's really about making a picture, not, not taking a picture. Um, so I really have to talk to people when I'm making photographs <laughs> and the camera gives it away. <laughs> you know, I have, to, I have to have their cooperation when I'm photographing them. But I've been really, you know, for the most part, I'm just really, um, people are very generous. You know, we have to remember that, that, that I know that it's dispiriting, it's dispiriting times, but I do believe that people are fundamentally good <laughs> and kind and generous. And I certainly have been the recipient of a lot of that generosity and, and kindness. And that shows in your photographs, I mean, that you're feeling that it is reflected in the photographs that you make. Thank and you, Marianne. Oh, <laughs> I love hearing that. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. And it's true, you're doing the work. But but they, they have this quietness. And even if the person looks sad, there's a moment of, of um, joy and possibility that's, that's just really wonderful. That I think also that that Robert Frank had in this this belief in the goodness of people. Yeah, we do have to remember that. Um, you know, of course, I think like any photographer, there's a bit of anxiety about photographing people, um, and you can't let the maybe one or two bad experiences color the rest. The rest, you know, because I would say that ninety. 9% of the time I've had really positive experiences and I've made really good friends um, through that process. You know, people that I, I've continued to stay in touch with. Um, you know, and some of the people that I, you know, my, my father's colleagues that first took me into those farm camps, you know, I still, I still go visit them and, um, you know, whenever, whenever I can, when I'm in California which is usually during the summers now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so any other questions or? I think that's the last one that we got. Okay. So, yeah, thank you so much again. We really appreciate your time. Oh wait, there's one more. Um, can, can you recommend other photographers of uh, Mexican life? 
Um, so someone that I, whose work I really love and, but she's photographing pri primarily in Mexico is a woman by the name of Graciela Iturbide. Um, her work is wonderful and it's really, I mean, it's just, it's an expansive, expansive body of work. Um, so that's one of, you know, maybe the first person that comes to mind because she's a photographic hero of mine. Um, and you, it's possible to see her influence in your work. I mean, she's the, the artist when you were showing your black and white work that immediately came to mind. I, <laughs> I do have a bit of, you know, <laughs> uh, that that photo crush <laughs> on her, <laughs> so to speak. And I just wrote her name. Um, I'm trying to think of other people. There's there's also, um, gosh, that's such a good question. And I'm trying to think of other people off the top of my head. There was a woman who did a really interesting project. And I think her name is Dulce Pinzon and she lived in New York City. Um, and photographed Latino workers as superheroes. Um, you know, that, that was a really interesting project. So that's someone else I could recommend. Um, I'm trying to think who else, you know, you'll have to email me. I have, I know, I know I have other people. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know who asked that question, but please, you know, feel free to email me. I think I put the, I can put my email here. It's on my website. So I would definitely respond. Um, it's just my first name followed by a period and my last name at gmail.com. I, I have people that I am just tongue tied right now. <laughs> well, that's the end of a long day of uh, end of a long week. But thank you so much for being so open and so generous with your time and with your comments and just also being really um, open to having people get in touch with you. I really appreciate that so much. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I love, I mean, teaching is, you know, my other love and like being able to like communicate with people and talk about photography. You know, the problem is you won't get me to stop once you start. So. <laughs> So well, thank you so much, everyone. Um, you know, stay safe, healthy and happy as, as much as we can be during these times. Um, you know, it's really, yeah, well, it's just, I don't know about you, but I'm feeling very just sort of out of sorts about everything and really wanting to be around people. We're social animals and it's so hard. <laughs> It's a tiny opportunity, <laughs> virtually, digitally. <laughs> yeah, so let's hope 2021 is, um, hopefully, hopefully it'll be better and hopefully we'll all get vaccinated and things will turn around. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. Okay, well, thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and, and duck out now. Okay, I'm going to. Have a good night, everyone. All right, thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>